All right. So just so if you guys don't know, I'm Steve Moss. I'm one of the sports med fellows over at Northwell. Um, and this will be one of our journal club um, presentations. So we're going to be talking about a pretty unique study. It's called the cross bracing protocol for ACAL rupture. Um, it's pretty controversial. It was just uh, published in June of 2023. Uh, there's going to be a lot of background to kind of how we got to this protocol um, and how we got to this study. Uh, so we'll touch on a lot of that and then we'll get into the study itself, which is, is pretty small um, and we'll go from there. Uh, the way I came about this study was actually initially through some research going into the bear implant, which is um, a new type of surgical technique that's being used um, for ACL injuries. And so when I was doing some Googling, uh, I ended up coming across this article, which is a pretty shocking headline if you're familiar with sports medicine, just saying a torn ACL can heal itself, new study shows. Um, and they're saying, you know, that, that surgery may not be needed for ACL injuries. So I saw this article, I, I read into it. Um, and came across this study. Um, this article doesn't really go into any of the limitations that, that is associated with the study, and it's a pretty bold headline for what the study actually shows, so we'll, uh, we'll get into some of that. Um, we all know the basic anatomy, so ACL itself is, is coming from the medial tibia and, and going to the lateral femoral uh, fat femur and, and supposed to help with some of that anterior translation. Um, so we'll be focusing on ACL injuries today. Um, most commonly, these are from non-contact pivot injuries with anterior tibial translation when the knee is in slight flexion of valgus, often on a planted foot. So that's why like soccer injuries are quite common. You could also have a blow to a lateral aspect of the knee. So things like slide tackles on a planted foot are also a common mechanism. Um, so you see as the knee valgus is, has some of that internal tibial rotation, um, you lose that supporting structure with the ACL and you can have uh, rupture. Uh, the epidemiology of it, uh, you'll find very different numbers in multiple different sources. Um, usually the average is about 68.6 per 100,000 person years, most commonly in males 19 to 25, um, and females 14 to 18. Uh, females are at higher risk. Again, the studies vary pretty, pretty remarkably um, from two to eight times more likely based on which study you look at. Uh, the most high risk uh, sports are football, basketball, lacrosse, soccer, skiing, gymnastics, anything where you're going to get a uh, risk of that planted foot and that anterior translation. Um, if you see like on the right, the table from one of these studies, the with gymnastics, this is per 10,000 athlete exposures, gymnastics at 34, uh, women's soccer is quite high, both men's and women's lacrosse is pretty remarkably high, football as well, because of mostly those um, kind of lateral blows to the knee. Um, and in, in total, there's about 200,000 ACL reconstructions per year uh, with an estimated cost of about $3 billion to the healthcare system. Uh, so non-operative management is not the standard of care. It's indicated for very low demand patients without the need for pitting and coding activities, but there's still a risk of increased meniscus and cartilage injury due to frequent buckling. Um, and the reason is that the, the current teaching is that they're poor healing of the ACL without reconstruction due to poor blood supply. ACL reconstruction is the gold standard. This first came about quite a while ago in 1895. The first one was performed. Uh, initially, they were using fascialotographs, and then they quickly they moved on to hamstrings, and now they're moving towards the gold standard, which is patella tendon and quad grafts. Um, the reason the patella tendon and quad grafts are a little more uh, gold standard is because they can actually take that piece of bone, um, and it's been associated with better outcomes. Um, so most surgeons are opting towards that um, as the gold standard. Um, there were other options uh, proposed in the past, so there's things like carbon fiber grafts that had really terrible outcomes in the 1980s, and so um, that was quickly abandoned. Um, and there's been a few recent studies that have brought into question kind of the gold standard of patellic tendon and quad graft. So there's the bare implant trials, which we'll touch on. Those were initially in 2016 um, and then another RCT in 2020. And they actually recently got FDA approval for uh, ACL repairs um, in people uh, age greater than 14. Um, and then there was the Canon trial initially in 2010 with a reanalysis in 2020, as well as the trial that we'll cover today, the cross bracing protocol trial that proposed either delayed ACL re reconstruction or complete non-operative management. So the bear, which we'll touch on quickly, is this implant um, that's put into the um, knee itself. So you have a torn ACL, you put in this bear implant, which is a bovine derived uh, type one collagen. Uh, it resorbs on its own in eight weeks. They take your own blood, they put it into the implant, and then they put it into that piece of torn ACL. 
um, you do still need to have a piece of ACL attached to the tibia for this to work, um, but it is FDA approved for people uh, greater than 14. Um, and the theoretical um, benefit is that you have the bare implant, which then resorbs and then it's replaced with healed ACL, and there is no need for the more advanced reconstruction. How this even came about initially started in 2016. Uh, so Murray et al. and Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine uh, put out this early feasibility cohort study. So it was only 20 patients, 10 to the bare, 10 to the ACL reconstruction. And the primary um, outcome was to assess whether this is um, even feasible, whether there's going to be deep uh, joint space infections, and whether there's going to be so much inflammation that they would need arthrocentesis and things like that. So that's the primary outcome with secondary outcomes, seeing that if this could be non-inferior to ACL reconstruction in terms of patient-centered outcomes, so things like um, certain uh, ACL knee scores, um, as well as laxity on Lockman. Um, and they found out with these 10 versus 10, bare versus ACL reconstruction, that it's both feasible, that there was no deep space uh, infections, and that um, they did not seem that uh, ACL reconstruction was superior to this bare. Obviously, a very small cohort, um, which kind of prompted this RCT that they did four years, that they published four years later. Uh, so again, Murray et al., this one was in American Journal of Sports Medicine, and this time they had 100 patients enrolled. Uh, they had 65 that were uh, in the bare implant group, and they had 35 that were in the ACL reconstruction group. Um, the interesting thing about this, out of the 35 that were in the ACL reconstruction, 33 of them got hamstring graft repairs, um, which is not really considered the gold standard at this point, um, and two got bone, patellar bone. So they're comparing, basically comparing the bare to a hamstring graft reconstruction. Uh, this time, the uh, primary outcome was these uh, healing on MRI as well as uh, laxity scored on unlockment uh, by a blinded provider, um, and just seeing that um, subjective scores were non inferior in the bear compared to the uh, ACL repair. Uh, after a two year follow up period, they did determine that the bear was non inferior in terms of outcomes. Um, so, patients' self reported outcomes returned to play. Um, and healing uh, noted on MRI as well as lax to the unlockment. Um, and not surprisingly, they found that people who had the bear had stronger hamstrings than those that mostly had hamstring grafts done. Um, so this is the trial that really prompted them to get FDA approval and kind of shook up the space of ACL repair, um, caused a lot of controversy in the surgical world. Um, but a little bit of outside of our scope of pro practice in terms of the non-operative management, um, we have been asked about the bear and something that probably will still be deferred towards the surgeon's opinions, um, but something to definitely be aware of. A little bit more in our realm as the non-operative side of sports medicine um, was this Cannon trial. Um, so this Cannon trial was initially published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. This was back in uh, 2010. Uh, the initial was in the New England Journal. The uh, secondary analysis was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Um, so in 2010, they uh, basically questioned the practice of early ACL repair, um, and they wanted to compare it to a strategy of just rehabilitation. Uh, versus and possible delayed ACL reconstruction versus getting that early ACL reconstruction. Um, and they found out that the group that had the delayed reconstruction or just rehabilitation first plus the optional delayed um, actually did better and that half of that delayed group actually never uh, underwent surgery at all. So the group Phil Bay et al. who actually published the paper we'll talk about shortly more in depth. Uh, saw this trial and they performed a secondary analysis of it, wondering why these this group that didn't have early ACL uh, reconstruction, why that group with the early rehabilitation and optional delayed ACL reconstruction had these good outcomes. Um, was there any healing? What was going on that, that prompted these patients to have any type of um, good outcome? Um, so when they reanalyzed re this group, they found out that of the 54 participants that were randomized to the optional delayed ACL reconstruction, um, 16 of the 54 actually had evidence of healing on MRI, um, which kind of uh, challenged this idea that the ACL itself can't repair um, if given some time. Um, and that was at two years. Uh, and those people that had the 16 of the 54 that actually had the healing on MRI uh, did report better patient-centered outcomes than the non-healed and the reconstructed ACLs. So while they were analyzing this, they were also performing this other trial in the background. So Phil Bayer was also performing this uh, cross bracing protocol study. Um, so this is a study that was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine back in June of 2023, um, and again made some 
you know, caused a little bit of controversy and uh, was a pretty important paper. Uh, the proposed hypothesis is pretty simple. Uh, there's, if you have absence of tissue bridging the gap of an ACL tear, you're going to have poor healing. Um, and there's been in vivo studies that have shown the distance between the insertion and the attachment of the ACL is shortest when the knee is at 90 to 135 degrees of flexion. So if we put the knee in that position, uh, which is illustrated in the, the graphic on the right, then the ends of the ACL are going to be closer together, and then this position may facilitate healing. So the study design is pretty uh, complicated, and um, we'll go over kind of what they did. So they had a case series of 80 what they call consecutive patients between age 10 and 58 who presented to this private sports medicine uh, physician in Sydney, Australia. They had an MRI confirmed full rupture of the ACL, and this was between March 2016 and 2021, uh, September 2021. Uh, you were included if you had a complete ACL rupture within one month of injury, if you were functionally independent and capable of managing a period of knee immobilization. Uh, you were excluded if you had evidence of a concomitant injury that required surgical intervention or if you had a DVT or PE or history of DVT or PE. Uh, so initially they started this in March of 2016. They only enrolled four people. Um, so four people uh, with ACL ruptures. Um, the reason those people chose to do this, so they were given the option to do it, uh, three of them just had to use a brace anyway for an MCL injury, and so they figured they would give it a shot and one try, wanted to try a non-surgical option. Um, then from March 2016 to 2019, no one was enrolled in this trial, um, so I'm not exactly sure how they're calling it consecutive patients, um, but in April 2019, it seems like the really enrollment process started to ramp up. Uh, they had 113 people who presented with full ACL ruptures between tw April 2019 and September 2021. Um, five people were not even offered the uh, cross brace because of bucket handle meniscus tears, DVTs, or a non-acute outside that one month window. Uh, 17 people declined and just went for ACL um, reconstruction. Most of those were professional athletes. Uh, the rest of them just preferred surgery uh, over this trial. Um, and then a little bit later on, this uh, while they're still enrolling these patients in February of 2021, they realized that it might not be best for people who had high-grade femoral avulsion injuries or if the ACL was actually flipped distally to be involved in this study. Um, so they start to discourage people with these type of injuries from even enrolling. They still offered it to them, um, but they are discouraged from doing so. Despite that, out of the 29 people that had that, 14 of them still chose to continue. Um, but again, they were kind of selecting who they wanted in this trial based on the, the type of injury that was uh, present. At the end of the day, when they got to September of 2021, they had 80 people in their trial over this five year period. Uh, characteristics of these patients, uh, age was uh, about 26, uh, less were female than male, uh, which is interesting. So 31% were female. Uh, time to injury to brace was eight days. Uh, most of them were competitive or recreational uh, athletes. There was only four professional athletes involved. Uh, the injury characteristics for the ACL rupture itself, um, 36 had an ACL femoral origin uh, that was intact. Uh, 17 had displacement of ACL tissue. Uh, about 44 had partial avulsion of the femoral origin, um, so not that high grade of uh, femoral avulsion that they were trying to avoid um, being in the trial. And 33, um, had, and they put 33 had displacement of ACL tissue when just above that they put that they're 17. So I'm not exactly sure where the number came from. Um, for concomitant injuries, there was MCL injury in about 40 patients. Um, one of them was uh, displaced medial meniscus ramp lesion. The rest were stable vertical tears in the posterior corn. Um, and then one they did not comment on. Um, PCL injury in about 31, bone and contusion, not shocking, in about 74 to 80, uh, one chondral injury, and six uh, subcortical fractures. Uh, the protocol itself is very straightforward. So if you presented in the first week, you were discouraged from anti-inflammatories, you were discouraged from cryotherapy, um, and that's so you don't impair your inflammatory response. Uh, if you're greater than seven days out, which is 14 patients, you got a PRP injection prior to be put, put in the brace um, to hopefully um, you know, help facilitate healing. Uh, and the brace was secured at 90 degrees of flexion at all times for four weeks. That includes sleeping and showering. Uh, 
after four weeks, the brace was adjusted for the protocol until 10 weeks where unrestricted range of motion was allowed. Uh, and then 12 weeks later, brace was removed, rehab protocol begins. Uh, you do have a physiotherapist checking in with these people once a week, so making sure that their brace is set correctly, that they're following the protocol correctly. Um, and then interestingly, for the first four patients that were enrolled in 2016, the protocol was only nine weeks at that time. Um, and then later on, they changed the protocol. Um, to make it that 12 week protocol. Um, and two of the 80 patients uh, for personal reasons took the brace off at week four and six and fell out of the trial. Um, so they go through in detail on the supplement their their 12 week protocol. I'll run through it very quickly because it's pretty monotonous. Um, but first four weeks are where you're locked at 90. You're non weight bearing with crutches. Um, you are put on river oxaban for DVT prophylaxis and like they're encouraging calf pump exercises and things like that. Um, and then you're starting some very, very light therapy. So things like uh, TheraBand, plantar flexion of the calf, um, some upper body strengthening, things like that. And they are very much encouraging like no NSAIDs, uh, no drainage, human arthrosis, anything like that. Um, as you move into the later weeks, you start to get more and more range of motion. So in week five, you're having 60 to 90 degrees range of motion on this brace. Uh, week six, you're at 45 to 90 degrees. You're still on DVT prophylaxis and you're starting to do a little bit more rehab exercises, but still pretty light um, in terms of what they're doing. Um, it's seven to eight. Week seven to eight, you're starting to get more towards full, full flexion. So you go from 30 degrees to full flexion and then 20 degrees to full flexion. And you're uh, partial weight bearing now up with crutches. Um, and this is still when you're on river oxaban, but you'll be on that for the last time at week eight. Um, and now you're starting to do a little bit more intensive rehab exercises. So things like wall squats and holds at certain um, degrees, as well as body weight squats uh, within the brace limits. Uh, week nine, you're starting to get more towards full range of motion, um, but this is where they were starting to see some fixed flexion contractures. Um, so people were about at 10 to 15 degrees having some flexion contractures. So they had a very intensive rehab pro program in terms of the physical therapy to try to overcome that. Um, and they were able to mostly overcome that by week 12. Um, as you move into the later weeks, you're starting to become full weight bearing. You're still wearing the brace at week 12, but it's unlocked and it's mostly there just for support. Um, and then you're starting to do actual real like ACL protocol rehab. Um, and by week 13 and 14, the brace is completely removed. You're in a physical therapy program, like a normal like ACL re reconstruction type program, um, and you're doing a lot more strengthening. Um, and that the 12 to 13 week mark is when you're getting your repeat MRI and you're getting a clinical review. Um, the outcomes that they're looking for. So the primary outcome is evidence of ACL healing on MRI, and they're using this ACL osteoarthritis score, which I'll briefly touch on. And then the second out, secondary outcomes are more patient centered. So you're having a self-reported knee function. So they use the lysome scale. Um, you're looking for knee related quality of life with the ACL QOL. Um, you're looking at passive knee laxity, so Lachman and pivot shift, shift tests, which were done by non-blooded uh, providers. Um, you're looking for re return to pre-injury sport and then ACL re-injury. Uh, they'll talk heavy about this ACLOS AS score, the ACL um, osteoarthritis score. Um, so if you're not familiar, a zero is normal ligament, three is complete disruption, and one and two are somewhere in between. So one is a thickened ligament um, with normal course and continuity, and two is a continuous ligament that's thin and elongated. Um, so that'll be important when we go through the uh, results. And then the patient-centered outcomes are pretty straightforward. There's these questionnaires. So the Lysholm is just this uh, 0 to 100 score, basically asking if you have a limp or using a cane, do you have locking sensation, how's your pain, how's your swelling, and the higher your score is, the worse you're doing overall with your knee. And the ACL QOL is a much more intense version of that, a 0 to 100 um, for several different factors. So they the physical complaints, but they're also talking about work, lifestyle. They're involving more like a social and emotional aspect of it. Um, and again, the higher uh, for this one, the lower your score is, the worse off you're doing. So zero is basically you can't do any of these activities. Um, so getting into the results, the primary outcome was the three and six month MRI. Do we have healing um, in terms of our ACL? So all of them start off as a grade three ACOLS sore, so a complete rupture. And then at the three month follow-up, they're saying, do we have a continuous ACL? 
So out of the 80 patients that were enrolled in the trial, 72 of them, so 90% had a continuous ACL when a repeat MRI, a repeat MRI was done at three months. Now, 30, so 40 of them had a grade one, so that was that thickened ligament um, that is continuous, um, and 32 of them had a grade two, so that was that continuous ligament that was like elongated and thinned. Um, and then of the eight patients that had um, ACLS grade three on the three month uh, MRI, six of those actually had attached to the lateral wall or the lateral wall and the PCL. So they weren't sure whether they would call that healing or whether what they would call that. So they're, they're kind of in their own category. But overall, 72 had a continuous ACL. Uh, eight of them had still a complete rupture, a complete disruption. So that grade three um, score. Uh, they then continue with the protocol and in six months got another repeat MRI. Um, so out of the uh, those patients, four of the participants changed from grade one. So four of the 40 that were grade one at the three month follow up became a grade zero. So they had a completely normal ligament at the six month MRI. And one participant changed from grade two to grade three. So it actually got worse. Um, and that was because of a sub uh, subsequent knee injury. Uh, they actually did, uh, they have a great supplement of all of the patients that had evidence of healing. I just took a snapshot of a few of them um, to show you what they were seeing on the follow-up MRIs in terms of healing. So obviously they all start at grade three, um, so they're all complete ruptures. And then looking at the three-month MRI, which is the section B, uh, this patient went from a grade three complete rupture to what they were calling a grade zero, a completely normal ligament um, at both three and six months. Um, for, for this patient, they went from a grade three to a grade one. So they're seeing a, a continuous ligament, but that it looks a little bit thickened and irregular. Um, and then for some reason, which is not explained at all in the paper, they have a 26 month MRI for this patient, which shows that it remains stable. And then same thing down here, grade three to grade one, and then at 12 months, um, also a grade one, a thickened, but uh, continuous ligament. And they go through with almost all the patients that had continuous ligaments. They show you their MRIs at both the uh, three month and sometimes six, sometimes 12, and sometimes later uh, MRIs. In terms of the secondary outcomes, so these are the more patient-centered outcomes. Um, and really with these, they focus more on comparing the, the grade one, so the continuous with thickened ligaments, the patients that were grade two or three, so the elongated or complete tears, and just seeing how quality of life uh, compared between those groups. Um, so patients, not, not shockingly, patients who had the grade one, patients had more healing on a three-month MRI, had better outcomes on both the lithium and the quality of life scale, um, and they had reduced laxity. So they had... Um, about, uh, I think I was, I forgot the exact number, but the grade one had a much, much better uh, Lachman scores than the, the grade two and grade three, which again is not shocking. Uh, the grade one also had a higher proportion of return to pre-injury sport. So 92% of the grade one uh, group actually returned to their pre-injury sport compared to 62% if you had a grade two or grade three. Um, re-injury rates were pretty high. So 11 participants re-injured their ACL within five to 18 months. So that's 14% of the cohort. Um, out of those 11 that uh, re-injured it, nine of them underwent ACL reconstruction. Uh, two of them actually opted to try the cross bracing protocol again. Uh, 38 of the 39 uh, meniscus tears were asymptomatic following completion of the protocol. Um, so 38 of the 39 is 90, 97%. Um, and only one of them actually went and got uh, arthroscopic knee surgery, not for the ACL, but for the meniscus tear itself. Uh, they go into pretty detail about their secondary outcomes. They have a lot of tables. So I'm just really going to touch on two points, which I, th I thought were pretty important. Um, they broke this down by the first column is all paid participants in the cohort. The second column is grade one, and then the third column is grade two and three. And you're just saying that the return to pre-injury sport at 12 months is obviously much higher in those that were grade one um, compared to those who are grade two or grade three. And then the ACL rupture rate uh, seemed to be less common in the, the patients who were grade one. So out of the 40 that were grade one, four of them uh, re-injured their uh, ACL as opposed to the uh, 32 of the grade two and three, uh, seven of them re-injured their ACL. Uh, adverse events 
adverse events throughout the trial were pretty minimal. Uh, they, they did have two DVTs. Um, they did resolve with anticoagulation. Uh, the major complaint was the discomfort in the first four weeks. They're at 90 degrees of flexion where they need to sleep and shower, which was quite difficult for patients. So there was a lot of complaints, but nothing major. Um, and then that flexion contracture uh, was an unexpected outcome. So five to 15 degrees in 11% of the, uh, in 11 patients, so 14%. Um, but it did resolve within three weeks of just manual and physical therapy. And then not shockingly, four patients had contralateral lower limb overuse injuries. So there was some patellofemoral pain, there was a peasant, serine bursitis, and there was some hamstring tendinopathy reported in four patients. Uh, the limitations of this study, uh, we can, there's, there's a lot. Uh, the study design itself is obviously uh, not ideal. Um, at first, they said they were enrolling consecutive patients, although if you actually look at the protocol and the study design, it doesn't seem that's the case. Um, again, they were also picking certain patients that they thought would be good candidates for the study, so they were discouraging certain patients um, who had certain types of injuries or femoral avulsion injuries that were higher grade. So there's definitely room for selection bias. Uh, we don't know what these conversations were like uh, with these patients. So the ones who chose ACL reconstruction, were they you know, encouraged to go that route or were they told about the risks and benefits? Um, it's kind of difficult to just you know figure out exactly who was selected to get into this trial because um, there's a pretty long study period and they ended up only with 80 patients in the end. Um, they did also change the protocol uh, after the first four pa patients. So it started in 2016 and there's a protocol change uh, several years later. Um, so that's also obviously a limitation. And then there's lack of blinding. Uh, the physicians performing the knee laxity testing were aware of what the study outcome was, uh, as well as the radiologist reading the MRI. And they are aware that all these patients were participating in the cross bracing protocol. Um, so there was no comparison to any controls, anyone who got ACL reconstruction. Um, there's really just comparisons to each other. So the conclusions uh, already at what I took from this trial, I mean, within this trial and previous studies, including the kind of trial, that there's definitely evidence of ACL healing. Um, we're seeing that on MRIs um, in both the canon trial and here, um, and that's without surgical intervention. Uh, the question is, does ACL healing on MRI really correlate to functionality? Uh, we're seeing pretty high re-rupture rates here, so is that something that's, you know, clinically relevant? Um, we're not exactly sure. Um, how do we predict who's going to have healing and who's not? Uh, they had 80 patients and only 40 of them um, got to this grade one uh, type of healing. And the grade one type of healing is the only thing that seems to suggest that they have any type of functional outcome uh, or any uh, clinical specific outcome. Um, so I don't know how we predict who's going to get there. Uh, the authors hypothesized that if you're having high grade femoral avulsion injuries that you're not going to heal. Um, so that's kind of one thought, um, but it's difficult to tell who else is going to be um, you know, more likely to heal than others. Um, there was some controversy when I was reading through some of the articles uh, talking about this paper. Uh, on the orthopedic side, they're wondering if, if this is really healing ACL or is this just scar tissue that we're seeing on MRI and being misread as healed ACL. It's possible. Um, you know, also the, the radiologists were unblinded to this. So are they looking more for healing? Are they, um, you know, how much can we trust those results? We don't know what the long-term re-injury rates are, the patient-reported outcomes, the prevalence of osteoarthritis, or any further knee injury um, that happens further out from this trial. I mean, it was just published in June, and we don't really have that data yet. Uh, I'm sure that this group is going to be publishing more, especially with this positive result that they're reporting here. Um, but I'd like to see how these results compare to like a traditional ACL reconstruction. So if we can take some of the people that opted out of the trial and opted more for that ACL reconstruction, are we able to compare those side to side and get more evidence of what their MRI is looking like or what their patient-centered outcomes are looking like. Um, but I have a feeling this paper is not going to go away, especially with, it, you know, it's published in the British Journal of Sports Med Medicine. They have a pretty high, uh, you know, impact, and uh, this group is definitely going to have some momentum to publish some more things going forward. Um, and I can see us, you know, as non-operative sports medicine getting patients asking more about this. Um, so it's definitely something to keep on our radar. Uh, here's all my references. So there's uh, the bear trials and everything else is in here. If you want to take a look and go through those studies, um, those were also quite controversial. So there's some good stuff in there. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything, um, definitely please ask. Yeah, I think the takeaway from this is that this is not an actionable uh, study. Definitely. And this will not change practice, but it is a really interesting um, kind of first step 
to to potentially changing a practice. I mean, I, I think Stevie hit on the head. This isn't a, a real trial. This is a this is a case series. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. and to call it anything other than that, I think is probably being a little disingenuous. It mm-hmm. is one hundred percent just like a case series with clearly very selected. Um, very specific patients. And that's not bad. It's just you can't generalize that to anyone except for the patients who are in this study. Um, and so I think if you, I, I think what it's probably not going to ultimately be non inferior to, to an ACL reconstruction, but at the same time, it doesn't sound like it's going to have nearly the, uh, the rehab that comes with that, the, you know, length and return to play and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of analogous. It seems like what non-op management for uh, Achilles ruptures look like, where you have a little bit of a higher um, re-injury rate or re-rupture rate, and you have a little bit less of an immobilization time and a little bit fewer complications in yeah. terms of like the actual, um, in terms of your treatment. Um, I don't, I don't know. I'm just the whole time I was reading this, I was thinking about would I do this? I honestly don't think I would, yeah. you know, like, a month at 90 degrees sounds miserable <laughs> yeah, um, all of it, you know like all of the stiffness that that would come with that mm-hmm. i think is, is really something to seriously consider um and like the flexion contractures are not small things those really hurt mm-hmm. and so you know this isn't um this isn't something that is going to i don't think it's anything that's ever going to really supersede you know or, or supplant rather uh an acl reconstruction um, but it's super interesting. I think it's a, it's a good thing to have in your armamentarium to discuss with patients who are a little bit low activity. Mm-hmm. Like I would probably be the ideal person for this type of uh, treatment because I do like I do some uh, sports and activities that require cutting, but nothing like what I was doing in my twenties. Mm-hmm. You know, like I jog and I cycle. Those are really my my two ways of getting uh, of getting exercise. So like. Do I need a reconstruction of my ACL if I blow it out skiing or something? Probably not. Yeah. But so, so it's it's a really good food for thought. I'm super curious, like I said, like you and Victor were saying, as to what like the next steps will be, mm-hmm. um, research wise. But uh, but but definitely nothing that I would bring to my patients right now in terms of hey, this is a potential option for you. Yeah. yeah it was interesting to too, see with this and with the Canon trial, like the patients who had the delayed ACL reconstruction didn't have, they actually had pretty similar, yeah. if not better outcomes. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if there'd be some that like down the line, if they're thinking non-operative to get through a certain period, yeah. like a senior year of college or something like that, yeah. and then delayed ACL. Yeah. Although that's just, that's just another thought. But, yeah. awesome. Anyone else have anything they want to add? No, just, uh, just you did an awesome job, Stephen. That was really, like thorough and and I was like uh, jotting down my little notes as you were going and then you you kind of addressed all the questions that I had at the end there which were kind of a lot of the same issues I had I did find it hilarious that uh, they they didn't really anticipate the uh, DVT prophylaxis thing until they were like ten patients deep it was just like that was the first thing I thought of was like you're putting these people in ninety degrees twenty four seven for four weeks and how many of them are going to die from PEs but I found it kind of funny that it took them that long to kind of realize that but uh, no yeah. otherwise. Um, yeah, I was just, I mean, the, the, the whole question, if this ever becomes a thing, right, it's just going to be, because it, unless they're getting to grade zero, grade one at three months, it doesn't seem like anyone's getting better after that, really. Um, so, you know, is there a way to predict who gets there? And then for those that don't, right, what's the, what's the feasibility of doing a delayed repair at that point and how successful is that going to be? I mean, it sounds like we're years away from kind of putting this sort of protocol into practice, but that, that's down the line, I think, going to be the main thing. But that was, you, you did an incredible job. That was great. And the bear stuff was really interesting. That was not something I was aware of. Yeah, the bear, bear is definitely something I just, just came familiar with in the first years of fellowship, first months of fellowship. And yeah, there's been people asking about it. So that, that trial is interesting to look at too. And that's, uh, I didn't go into as many of the controversies as there are because it's comparing to hamstring. So there's a lot of good uh, good stuff in those papers as well.